Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Philip Rothman of Scoring Notes, the Scoring Notes uh, website for music notation software and related technology. And I have the great pleasure of being here with Daniel Spreadberry of Steinberg. He's the product marketing manager for Dorco. And today we are here to talk about the very latest Dorco news, uh, specifically two items. Uh, Dorico 3.1, which is a major update with lots of new uh, features and improvements uh, to the Dorico flagship product, and a brand new offering called Dorico SE, which is completely free and download to use. So we're excited to talk about all that and more. So Daniel, welcome. It's very good to see you and chat with you again. Thank you very much for having me, Philip. And I'm sorry that we're not actually together in person as we normally would be at this time of year. But it's sadly, true. when this, when this, everybody sees this, you'll be in LA and I'll be in Austria. Whereas right now, of course, I'm in London and you're in New York. So we're kind of crossing continents as we always do. That's right. And we have uh, spent time together in various places around the globe. New York, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Anaheim, California, where uh, the NAM show uh, is going on, uh, Helsinki, Finland, and, uh, and even uh, in, in London as well. So, um, so I appreciate you uh, making the time and, and, and being available to us. And, and I should say that we are releasing this uh, in conjunction with the NAM show, although it's being uh, recorded uh, several days prior, uh, because you will be uh, somewhere else. And maybe uh, I think it'd be interesting for our viewers and readers to hear actually where you're going, and what you'll be doing. Yeah, so there's a, there's a new conference which is being held at the Mozarteum School in Salzburg, Austria, um, called Music Engraving in the 21st Century, which is uh, right up my street. So um, there'll be, uh, we're actually sponsoring the conference, uh, us at Steinberg. So um, we're very excited to be, to be doing that. It's the first time the conference has been run. It's got a very interesting uh, conference schedule. Um, the keynote speech will be given by our... <laughs> I was, I was going to say Queen Elaine Gould, but maybe that's maybe I shouldn't say that. But uh, certainly Elaine, of course, the author of Behind Bars, closest thing we have to a Bible in uh, in our in our world, perhaps. She'll be giving the keynote speech, which is something that she um, she does quite a bit actually uh, these days, um, which will be really interesting. Um, I'm doing not only a presentation but also holding a hands-on workshop there as well, and there'll be a number of other. Uh, people from uh, typically from more of the sort of free and open source uh, software world will be in attendance as well. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting conference. And, you know, it obviously it was interesting enough uh, for me to decide to go there rather than to go to Anaheim this year. Although, of course, um, Steinberg and Dorico will be ably represented by by John Barron, who perhaps you might um, already have chatted with by the time this this goes up. Um, so if, if people want to see Dorico at the NAM show, it's absolutely there and i'm sorry i'm not there i imagine well depending on what happens with the this other conference if it if it happens again maybe at, a, at the same time then who knows but um, i imagine i'll be making a return next year but this year i'll be swapping sunny california for snowy salzburg so um, hopefully it'll be very interesting will any of those proceedings be recorded either your talk or elaine gould's or any of the other ones Great question. I'm I'm not sure actually. Um, we'll see. We'll see when we get there uh, whether okay. or not that's that's going to be possible. But I think it would be obviously very interesting to have uh, to have at least Elaine's session recorded. I mean, you know, I just prattle on about Dorico endlessly, but uh, but I, I think Elaine will have some interesting stuff to say. Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, if it, if it is and you hear about it, by all means, uh, please let us know. Um, and like you said, uh, Dorico uh, and as well as the, all the other Steinberg and Yamaha products will be at NAM. And since this is being released uh, at while NAM is in progress, if you are there, uh, head on over to the Elite Two Ballroom, which is where Dorico will be featured. And of course, uh, that's in the uh, Marriott Hotel, which is uh, just adjacent to the. Uh, Anaheim Convention Center. It's actually not right in the main convention center, which is sprawling enough as it is, but then there are all these other satellite locations as well, uh, and the Marriott Hotel being one of them, um, and there's lots going on there. So uh, by all means, please uh, feel free to check it out. Uh, I might even be there when you're there, so um, feel free to say hello. Um, and uh, yeah, and you know, it's interesting, Daniel, you're, to Scoring Notes readers, you are probably the most familiar figure uh, to many of us, and I, I know we want to get talking about Dorco, but just 
with, without going too far down memory lane, I, I think it's worth <laughs> mentioning your your spe, your special role here. And and you know you you were talking about giving talks and and uh, and presentations. And and of course, I do the same um, to university students and other places, uh, whether it's about music notation, uh, the craft of it in general, or uh, the technology behind it. And I'm always gratified to meet students uh, and other people, uh, professors, teachers. Uh, who follow scoring notes, and they tell me that it got them through school. And uh, and I, you know, I, I don't think they mean that we were underwriting their scholarship. Uh, but uh, <laughs> would be nice. I'd like some of that money if that's available. <laughs> and if you would like to underwrite someone, please click the donate button on. Uh, <laughs> scoring notes. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I mean, uh, obviously, it was a very, you know, it's been a very important source of news, tips, and other information throughout the years and throughout the formative years, really, of a lot of these students who have now probably gone through their entirety of their uh, you know, secondary, post-secondary education with it. And uh, they should know, if they don't, that you started the blog uh, way back in 2008, uh, of course, when it was known as Sibelius Blog, and very graciously handed it over to me uh, in 2012. Um, when, of course, you know, over time we expanded its scope uh, not only to include Sibelius, but uh, the other products uh, as well, and quite naturally changed the name of it to, to reflect that uh, uh, updated mission in 2017. So, I, but I, you know, I think it would be fair to say that I wouldn't be doing this without you and what you did to get it going and to build a following. So, um, you know, in addition to everything else that you had going on at the time. So, so thank you for that. I, I really appreciate it. I know everybody else does as well. Well, scary thought. I was only running the blog for four years, and you've now been running it for nearly eight years. So that that's, is, that's something terrifying. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And it, and, it, and it keeps going on. So Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, no, and, and it's a testament to, to the entire field, really, of uh, there's uh, material worthy of coverage. So we're glad to do it. Uh, so look, so now that we know that the scoring, scoring notes readers are familiar with with Dorico. Uh, if if you're watching this video and you came here through some other means, internet search, looking for cat videos or whatever, uh, you should know that uh, Dorico, of course, <laughs> Dorico is Steinberg's cat. music. I <laughs> so, this is a good, so this is a good point, actually. So what? So I've heard music notation software. I've heard scoring app, scoring program. What? What? What do you call? How would you actually? What is the terminology that best describes what Dorico is? I think the official terminology is the is Steinberg's next generation music notation software. Although it's kind of this generation's now, I guess, since we're here. But um, that's what we call it. All right. Well, it's uh, whatever you call it. It's it's powerful stuff, and it, it you know we were talking about getting together. I remember being in London um, and being in the office a couple of years ago, and being a end an end user of the product uh, of music notation software, as you say, and expecting it uh, to display something that looks like. A printed score. We've got the notes. We've got little black dots. We've got lines. We've got bars, stems, and all the usual bits, symbols, music notation. And then going and meeting your developers and seeing those huge vertical, uh, you know, portrait-oriented uh, uh, monitors yeah. uh, with just thousands and thousands of lines of code, uh, and somehow magically, it, you make it all transform into beautiful looking notation, uh, you know, music notation. And of course, with Dorico, uh, uh, of course, the underlying philosophy of it is that it's not just beautiful graphic notation, but it has the, um, you know, the understanding of what's behind it, the musical notation. It understands, you know, what it's actually representing musically. It's just, so I think, you know, it, it's it's interesting to call it software. I mean, it's a computer pro, it is a computer program at the end of the day. And yet we just, you know, like almost like an app on our phone, we open it and we see it does, blah, 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 and there it is. So it's pretty impressive what you and your, your team have built. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've been doing it a long time. I was, uh, believe it or not, I think, I mean, some people, a couple of people on the team have been there even longer than me, but I've been doing this for 21 years now. So that's slightly horrifying uh, as, we, as we start another decade. It's like my third decade doing this now. That's, that's, uh, that's a thing. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we, we couldn't, be, couldn't be prouder of, of what the team is achieving with Dorico. You know, we just continue to, to power on with it. Um, 
And again, we're very, very fortunate to have uh, the support of, of Steinberg. 2019 was Dorico's best year yet um, by, by some margin. Um, and we're, we're hoping that 2020 is going to uh, continue to see the program really going from strength to strength. And part of that is what we're doing with the software development, of course, but part of it is also about how we reach um, new customers. And, you know, what we're what we're seeing now, which is good, is that, you know, because even until relatively recently, and of course it still does sometimes happen, we, we meet people at shows, events, or even, you know, at the pub or whatever it might be, um, and you sort of say, oh, yeah, yeah, I work on, I work on Doric. And they go, oh, what's that? And these are musical people, right? And they say, oh, I don't really know what that is. But but just recently, I think we're now we're now kind of managing to penetrate because that you know we have this little bubble that we're all part of, who read publications like Scoring Notes and Go to the Nam Show and, and all the rest of it. But of course, there's hundreds of thousands of musicians out there who uh, for whom you know Sibelius or Finale or, or whatever is just a very small part of their musical life, and they they have many other things to worry about. They might be a teacher who you know gets to use the software once a week um, because they need to do something for their for their school ensemble, or they might be you know, an amateur who who isn't, you know, maybe connected to the wider musical world, but is doing it for the love of, you know, composition or arranging or whatever it might be. And slowly but surely, we're now starting to reach those people as well. Um, so that I think is going to be is going to be key to uh, to really pushing Dorico on in, in 2020. And that's actually a big part of why we're doing Dorico SE, uh, which was, as, as you're watching this now, was released yesterday, um, along with Dorico 3.1. Uh, because you know, we, we've got so much incredible technology in Dorico. And I think that a lot of the benefits, and you and I have spoken about this before, um, even just after Dorico was was first released, that, you know, going from Finale to Sibelius, you see a very big difference, like in terms of the way the software is organized and all the rest of it. And of course, Dorico looks very different to Sibelius, but um, doesn't, maybe, doesn't maybe feel as sort of such a big departure um, in a sort of generational way, as, as say Finale or to Sibelius did, and Sibelius Dorico maybe doesn't feel like such a generational departure. And I think that what we've what we also found is that particularly for people who are already using other software, you have to see it to believe it. Um, we can tell you over and over again, and I will at great length, and hopefully not too boring, <laughs> how how good Dorico is, how much time it saves, um, how you know how smart the program is, how easy it is to learn, and so on. But of course, the, the truth of the matter is that, you know, all these things are tested in battle. They're tested in, in the heat of battle. They're not tested on a web page or a YouTube video. So um, and I think that one of the things that, you know, and of course, all of the notation programs, including including us, we give you a free trial. You can download it. You can use it for 30 days. It's fully functional. But even so, you know, again, for those busy musicians who are maybe not using the software every day, having that 30-day trial limit, and you can only have one trial of Dorico, you can't download another trial of the same version. You have to wait for the next version after that. It means that actually committing that time it is kind of is kind of an issue. Plus, of course, even leaving aside the people who are already using software, there's obviously new kids coming you know, every day to the internet for the first time and wondering about writing music for themselves and, and what are they going to do? They're going to go to Google and they're going to look for free software. That's that's inevitably what they're going to do. And of course, there are wonderful free software uh, packages out there for music notation these days, totally different than when you and I were looking for software for the first time, you know, 20 odd years ago. Now you've got Muscore, you've got Noteflight, you've got Lillipond, you've got all these, all these incredible tools. Um, and, you know, obviously we don't expect that Dorico SE is going to replace Noteflies and MuseScore and so on. But what we did want to do was give people a flavor of the unique things that Dorico itself has in a, in a package that has no sort of time limit. Obviously, it has many limitations, the most significant one being that you can only write for um, up to two players in the same project. But that notwithstanding, otherwise, it's pretty much the entire Dorico experience. It's got the Halion Sonic SE sound library. It's got, you know, the sample playback. It's got Mixer. It's got Play Mode. It's got um, it's got all of Dorico's amazing automatic notation. You can have multiple flows. You can create, um, you know, multiple tonality systems and write with microtonality. You can write in open meter. You can write in polymeter. All of these things that, that Dorico does that are kind of unique um, among notation software in terms of the flexibility that it gives you as a composer. And some other notation programs have tried to imitate some of the things that Dorico has brought to the you know, brought to the table in over the last few years, slightly pale imitations, in my opinion, of course. But what we hope that Dorico SE gives is the opportunity for people to try it for themselves and um, 
without the pressure of having a 30-day limit on it. And, of course, it's also a useful Dorico viewer as well, because, of course, you can just download it, you can run it. It can open projects that have more than two players. They open read-only. You can still play them back. You can print them. You can export PDFs of them and so on. You just can't edit them. So, overall, we feel like it's a really valuable addition to the Dorico product family. Um, we hope that it will be appealing to schools who might want to um, invite their students who are using Dorico Pro or sometimes Dorico Elements, but normally Dorico Pro in the classroom to have it at home so that they can um, they can complete their homework assignments or they can just mess around with it and, and enjoy messing around with it. And of course, it's backed up by you know, by a big company like Steinberg, it's got. Uh, we've done a whole series of of, of special tutorial videos um, with with Anthony, um, working the way through a, an introductory project that you can do. You can sort of follow along and do inside Dorico SE, plus all of the other amazing tutorial content and so on. So we feel like, you know, that there's a kind of critical mass of of really interesting things that Dorico itself can do, and we hope that Dorico SE is a way of then opening that up to to people who are interested either. Maybe they might want to switch, but they're not sure and they need a bit more time. Maybe they're coming to notation software for the first time. Maybe they know somebody else who's using Dorico. They want to give it a try, maybe share some projects with them and so on. But the nice thing about it is that it, it then gives us something that anybody can can take away, anybody can, can play with. And we hope that obviously over time we're going to see um, people moving up from trading up from Dorico SE to Dorico Elements and, and maybe even to Dorico Pro. Uh, beyond that so it's it's a very exciting thing for us to introduce and i feel like it's a good time for us to do it you know dorico really does have a critical mass of, of pretty much everything you could you could want now obviously there's you know in in terms of um avant-garde or, or sort of mid 20th century and later notation there's still a few gaps of course i mean many gaps you might say and if we're talking about kind of pre baroque or maybe even kind of early baroque uh music with things like you know figured bass and so on there's still a few gaps there which we will close of course as we have closed every other competitive gap that has existed between dorico and the other programs and generally speaking again you know biased observer of course but we believe that we address these competitive gaps in a way that is far superior in terms of musical intelligence in terms of semantic richness in terms of ease of use and in terms of the graphical quality of the output if we can continue to do that with the gaps that we that we have um, and of course you know the new lines feature in dorica 3.1 which we might talk a little bit about shortly starts to move us in in that sort of 20th century direction um, and there's obviously lots more to come you know one thing we can be sure of is i may have been doing this for 21 years but no shortage of more things to do sadly right. but altogether all i think that you know dorico se is a really, really interesting value proposition. And I hope that even readers of this blog, who are obviously probably very familiar with Doric, at least conceptually, even if they're not yet using it themselves, you know, tell your friends about it, give it a try yourself. Um, there's really, you have nothing to lose and you can um, enjoy a great deal of the power of Dorico and experiment with all of its unique um, features and, and enjoy play mode and insert mode and all these wonderful things um, for yourself. Um, for nothing. You've got nothing to lose, so give it a try. That's a very comprehensive and thorough overview of uh, Doric OSE, and I think, it, you know, I think you might have been reading my mind uh, as I had a number of questions, and you answered them very, uh, you know, uh, very one after the other. Um, so uh, one of the things that stuck out uh, to me, though, was that I think unlike other, um, you know, software products that have a a free version, an introductory version. If I understand correctly what you're saying, Dorico SE, other than the limitation on the number of players, which uh, is two, I believe, uh, everything else, all the advanced features, the functionality that is built into Dorico Pro is available in uh, Dorico SE. Is that is that right? Not quite. Is everything basically oh, okay. is in Dorico Elements is in Elements. Dorico SE. So the, the one okay. big the one big missing thing from Elements and SE is in Grave mode. So right. you get okay. four modes rather than five in Dorico okay. SE and Dorico Elements. Um, and there's a couple of other features that are missing, like Divisi, for example, is missing. Condensing is missing. But um, but apart from that, you're you're basically getting and certainly in terms of 
all of the um, all of the interesting things that you can do in terms of the musical content, whether it's meter, key signature, insert mode, you know, the flexibility of inputs and editing, play mode with the piano roll, with the mixer, with automation lanes, the new dynamics lane that we introduced um, in Dorica 3.1 as well. All of those things are there. So we've really tried to give um, everybody as much as we as we sort of feel we can really, We're, rather than trying to find things to take out. We've instead, you know, looked at Dorica elements and said, well. What would happen if we basically just made Dorico Elements only be able to do two players? You know, that that really is, you know, that's that's software that we sell for, you know, 100 bucks, basically. And then we we chop 10 players out of it. You get two players and we're giving that away for free. So, okay. you know, it's a very, very strong value proposition. Um, and, you know, right. for people who only want to write for voice and piano or violin and piano or solo guitar or guitar tablature, it might be all the software they ever need. Uh, but we obviously hope that people will find they fall in love with Dorico SE and they do want the additional power. They want the extra sounds. They want the extra options. And, and then they want to move up on up um, through the product line over time. I see. Okay, so it's really uh, Elements is the more similar product in terms of the feature parity between the two, uh, the free version and the what we might call the intermediate version Elements. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and... It is uh, Steinberg introducing, and you know, forgive me, I'm not as familiar as I could be or should be with the rest of the product line, you know, Cubase and Nuendo and such. Uh, is there a similar, um, you know, tiered uh, version uh, of each of those different uh, products as well that <laughs> more or less corresponds to what you're offering in Dorco? Yeah, kind of, although they're, they're not just available freely to download um, mm -hmm. for the other product lines. So both, I mean, Nuendo, there isn't a cut-down version of Nuendo. Nuendo, of course, is the top-of-the-line pro audio post-production, very widely used in, in you know, video game production, especially because of uh, things like its integration with the with the sort of main middleware that, that games developers use, uh, which is a thing called WISE by Audio Networks. Um, so there's no cut-down versions of Nuendo. But, for example, Cubase and WaveLab, there are cut down versions of those. Those are actually called Cubase LE and uh, WaveLab LE. And, and people might remember that when Dorico 3 was introduced in September, we talked a little bit about Dorico LE. But actually, um, over the last few months, we've been thinking a little bit about, about the strategy and, and the way that the LE products work. Um, and there's also another variant of Cubase called Cubase AI. Those are actually bundled with other products. So, for example, if you buy an audio interface from Yamaha or some other of their pro audio gear, you will get Cubase AI, for example. If you buy a Zoom um, field recorder, you will get Cubase LE or WaveLab LE in that package. And we have various kind of OEM uh, deals, as it were, with different manufacturers of products. And those LE products go in those OEM bundles, effectively. So Cubase LE, WaveLab LE, um, and Cubase AI, they're effectively bundled versions. And we thought about that, um, and we would like to, and we're very open to doing bundling, if anybody's watching this and they're interested in bundling Dorica with their piano or whatever, we'd love to hear from you. But uh, but we looked at the, um, the the main opportunity that's in front of Dorico, which is that, obviously, despite the fact that, as I say, we had a great year last year, and, and the program is really growing strongly and, and going from strength to strength, um, which, is, which is very gratifying for those of us who are working so hard on it. But still our biggest opportunity, you know, it's different with Cubase and WaveLab. Those programs are wonderful and they're very mature and they've been around for, you know, decades in both cases. Cubase, of course, celebrated its 30th birthday in, in 2019 and uh, WaveLab is, is more, I believe, more than 20 years old as well. So, but Dorico is a baby by comparison. And of course, it's also, you know, Cubase and WaveLab to some degree defined the market segments that they are now mature members of. Dorico, on the other hand, is kind of peeping about between the slightly crusty old legs of, of Finale and Sibelius and trying to attract um, attract some attention. So um, having a free version of, of Dorico is hopefully kind of a, a beachhead, as it were, for people to be attracted to the Dorico platform for the first time and give them, effectively remove the barrier to trying it, you know, because the trial version is great and works very well. We had a lot of people try the trial and then they 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 end up buying the program after trying the trial, like a really high number, which is fantastic. Um, but we we want to open it up even more. So so it's it's kind of different because of the products. You know, the markets are a little bit different in terms of what the other programs out there are. Um, and although, of course, there are free and open source audio editors, there's nothing that does the mastering and you know audio production what the WaveLab does. And there are free 
digital audio workstations um, and they're wonderful in their own right but they don't have the same maturity breadth of features and in particular the same musical focus for songwriters and producers to write really write music rather than necessarily only working with audio that Cubase has so though those products kind of they, they have a very defined role in the markets that they that they occupy dorico is in a slightly different position and so that allows us to think a little bit differently about how to take it to a wider range of people and hopefully grow the dorico community um uh, as strongly as we can in, in the coming coming year yeah, well, there's an opportunity there, and you've defined it, you've identified it, and defined it, and uh, you've created uh, an offering to to uh, take advantage of it uh, as you know you see fit. Um, it, just a very um, <laughs> cut and dried question: What does SE stand for? Uh, whatever you would like it to stand for. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> that's what i thought <laughs> <laughs> yes no i mean seriously though there isn't really a a defined thing we 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 obviously deliberate it i mean naming things is very difficult and sure. um, we had all sorts of, of of sort of fanciful ideas and we had one that we really really liked but which i won't tell you because it's really good um but we we decided against it because in in the end it would actually it would define the product a little bit too strongly and what we really wanted with the with the se name is is just a say it's just another member of the family it needs to sound like it's at the beginning of the fam- of the product line um not at the not at the end so it couldn't have anything too flashy you know it could be like dorico ultimate or something um you know banal like that it had to be something you know banal in a different editor- way editorializing about other software but that's no no not, the- not at all <laughs> But it had to be something, as I say, banal in a different way. In a sense, what we really wanted to co- to communicate is the Dorico name, not not necessarily anything else. And so it's it doesn't mean anything. We have other things called SE. So, for example, Haley and Sonic SE is the kind of free version of Haley and Sonic, which is the mini so well, it's not that mini actually it's a sampler workstation halion is the big sampler workstation where you can define your own patches and so on. Haley and Sonic is like a kind of if you like sort of a Yamaha keyboard on steroids in terms of like a rompler, you know, where you can do all this wonderful sample stuff. And then Halion Sonic SE is a cut down version of, of that kind of sampler workstation approach. And that comes with Dorico and it comes with Cubase and so on. And there's Groove Agent SE, which is a cut down version of Groove Agent that comes with, with Cubase and so on. So we use the SE appellation to sort of mean sort of a sort of a kind of free cut down version of something else and we we just decided to to go for that rather than some of the other fanciful things that we were going for and uh, yeah it doesn't really mean it doesn't really mean anything but you know you could think of it as starter edition or starter edition it was the thing that came to mind yeah yeah okay all right good uh well look uh certainly wish you all the best with it and uh, it is it's very exciting i think you know certainly the the main difference uh well i mean obviously there are several differences between a fully functional trial version of dorico pro and this but certainly the ability to just open it up whenever you like you're not obligated to buy a try uh, to, to buy the full version obviously of course that's your hope that you're not uh, doing this uh, purely on an altruistic basis but uh, at the same time uh, uh you know the fact that oh i gotta you know, think about when i want to start my you know, time limited trial version and then what if i something else came up and then i'm at day 28 no i never didn't have time to try it and, uh, you know just forget about it but this is a chance for people to just have it on their computer say hey you know let me figure out a project let me see how it works when it do things differently than the other software or you know indeed if it's something that uh, someone's coming at for the first time um and like you said i mean it's it is it is i i really i really have to give you uh you know a lot of credit credit and um you know, you know, because you're because you're eating not, eating not only against, against, like you said, you said the uh, uh, two two uh, uh, main commercial, commercial products, products out there, Finale and Sibelius, uh, but, uh, but you're also you're also eating as they are, as they quite are honestly, quite honestly, the the, the free the offerings, offerings as well, as well, like which are said, also which are growing also more and more more robust and fully featured by the day as well. And so there's a lot of it's not like you know reference the the old days when you and I were growing up and looking at notations. Although even then there were several different offerings out there. Of course, yeah. Uh, so, uh, but you know, the market has changed, and it has kind of, um, you know, we we do see uh, basically, you know, where where uh, 
the main players are in the commercial high-end desktop notation software space, if you want to call it that. And certainly on the blog, I mean, we, we, we try to cover as much as we can on scoring notes. But uh, if you go to our product guide, which is something that we launched uh, last year, and we try to keep up to date with um, the at least the pro versions of the of 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 really the four uh, products, and that's of course your offering, Dorico, uh, Finale, Sibelius, and MuseScore. Even though there are other products out there, certainly there's Notion, uh, like you said, there's NoteFlight, uh, there's there's uh, SoundSlice, there's a whole bunch of other things um, that uh, do music notation. It's just you know you start getting into other. They have other goals, and they they aren't looking necessarily to to be the high end uh, you know production uh, tool that uh, people are using. And, and I think the interesting thing is that on one hand, even though you are, you know, doing something in a professional, you know, you're going after that high-end professional, at the same time, you know, these professionals don't start from nowhere. Like I got my start being a student and, you know, learning music notation for the first time, music, music notation software for the first time. I certainly didn't spring fully formed knowing everything there is to know. And of course, I still don't know everything there is to know. Hardly, you know, none of us do. Um, but the point I'm trying to make is that, um, you know, there is a there is a continuum of uh, of, of learning and of, of feature knowledge uh, that that goes with any of these programs. And I think the tricky thing uh, that uh, anyone that is producing these things have to, has to do is is both make it accessible and easy so that someone with you know not a lot of uh, you know not reading the entire 700 pages or whatever it is whatever how long the manual is now back to you know back to back. Um, you know, needs to do that before they start entering a note. They can just start going with it, and then as they start discovering more and more, and then get more into it, uh, they can say, "Oh yeah, oh do I want to do. Oh, this is how I do this. This is how I add. You know, an instrument change. This is how I, you know, add a, another movement, add a flow, add another layout. Uh, this is how I add voices. And you know, you start expanding your knowledge that way. And and you know, look, I mean, obviously, what you've uh, you're you're trying to do is is create something that can encompass all of it and still get people in um, at, uh, at at uh, you know Absolutely. square one, so to speak. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Just yep. just one more thing, because people might find interesting to know, is that you know, just like Dorico Elements and Dorico Pro are the same software, just <clears throat> unlocked by a different license type. So is SE the same as Elements and Pro as well. So, you know, if you try, for example, Dorico Pro for 30 days or Dorico Elements for 30 days, both of those have 30 day trial versions. They won't automatically become Dorico SE at the end of that period, but you can just go to our website and go to download Dorico SE again, as if for the first time, you'd actually need to download anything else. It'll email you an activation code. You'd put that into your e-licensor and then your trial version, which had expired, um, you know, and, and you theoretically kind of lost everything you worked on during your trial. Well, you can now, you can just run it as Dorico SE just by adding that free activation code. So yeah. that's something that people who, who try the trial and maybe Dorico doesn't stick with them yet. I'm sure it will in the future, but even if it doesn't stick with them right at the end of that first trial period, you can at least then turn your trial into an on going copy of Dorico SE by, by just going and grabbing an activation code from our website. And the website will happily give you as many of those as you like. So give them to your friends, tell your, tell your family, give it to your dog, your cat, your next door neighbor, um, go for it. Uh, related points, actually two of them. So if somebody has a fully fledged license of Dorico Pro, I believe it's possible just if you hit an override key when you launch the product, you can actually launch it as one of one or other of the uh, different flavors, if you will. That's right. Yeah. So if you hold down hold down the Alt key when you load it, it will become uh, Dorico Elements. Hold down the Command key on the Mac or the Control key on Windows when you launch it, and it will be Dorico SE. So yeah, you can you can see um, how the other how the other programs work. And for example, we think especially that might be helpful for teachers who of course, might be yeah. thinking about how you know if they're thinking about how they're going to plan an assignment they want kids to be able to do on on their on their machines at home being able to run the program that way and, and also remember which features are and aren't there. So, you know, don't ask them to do condensing or don't ask them to do divisi or whatever, because those features aren't, aren't going to be there. Um, but, but yeah, it, it hopefully useful. I mean, you know, totally honest, we saw that Sibelius did that when they introduced the, the, the different flavors and right. we saw that that was well, well received um, by their users for exactly that reason. And we thought that's a good idea. So, uh, so we decided to, to make it do the same thing. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, like you said, they made a change, um, I think it was about a year ago or so, where it was instead of having it be three different products, it was something that was a, a one download and you, you got them all. Um, and, uh, you know, for that very reason, um, being able to not have to think about, oh, wait a second, I can't do this in another software. My student doesn't have this particular flavor of the software, but also so you don't have to buy you know, certainly you don't have to buy three different licenses for, for the three sure, products. Yeah. You can buy just one and, and get the other two. Um, and uh, the other thing, really kind of the kind of the reverse of it, and and this is, you know, again with Sibelius, it's broadly similar, is that the, the starter version can open and uh, print and play back uh, a fully-fledged Dorico Pro uh, product. You don't need um, any special uh, other software to do it. Like so if somebody sends you a Dorco Pro, you know, so it can be think you can think of it almost like a a reader plus. A reader. Like Absolutely. yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Uh, well, that's good for everybody to know. Certainly, uh, I think uh, at the very very least, if somebody has a Dorico, you know, and and again for those of us in the music uh, engraving space or the professional space where maybe not all of us have Dorico uh, yet. And um, but and somebody sends us a Dorico, a Dorico file, we can get Dorico SE and at least, uh, you know, at the very least, look at it. If we need to print it, we need to see what it's like. Um, and uh, so, I, you know, there, there are a lot of other uh, tangential uses for the, the way you built it. So uh, congratulations. I think it's a great Thanks. offering and, uh, you know, certainly a useful addition to the product line. Um, so. Uh, look, that's a Dorico SE, and uh, you know those of you that are watching, uh, you can go and download that from the Dorico website uh, now. It's available, um, but uh, we are going to move on to some, you know, Dorico Pro 3.1, which is something a lot of you are interested in, and uh, certainly Dorico 3.0. 0, 3.0, 3.0, call it what you like. It came out in late the late summer of uh, 2019, um, early September, I believe it was. And uh, that was a fully packed uh, uh, release. And that's the that only was, way we do them. Of course. Well, you're you're fully you're fully packing a lot of these. Uh, I have to say that was a uh, that was a paid upgrade. Three point one is a free upgrade or update, I should say, to be clear, uh, update to for those people that are using three point zero right now. Um, but uh, far from being just a maintenance update, uh, you did issue a very small uh, three point zero point ten update uh, for uh, Catalina com com compatibility and a few other yeah. things. But uh, three point one is 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 jam packed. Uh, there are four major new features uh, in it and a host of other things that I think you're modestly calling improvements, but uh, certainly we could call them uh, new features or at least feature enha enhancements in their own right. Uh, but those uh, being uh, the uh, condensing changes and condensing, of course, is the feature that is unique to Dorico introduced in 3.0 that uh, allows you to take uh, multiple uh, instruments, uh, multiple players, I should say, uh, and condense them onto uh, one in one staff, uh, or I suppose uh, several staves, depending on how you do it, um, for the purpose of score, for the ease of score reading, and to, to do it automatically. And the concept, as simple as it sounds, is devilishly uh, difficult to achieve. Uh, I know it's something that you guys were working on since the very, very uh, early days of Dorico, before you even had a name for Dorico, I think. Uh, it was a part of the early concept of it. And uh, 3.1 introduces uh, condensing changes, uh, which are the ability to override, essentially override uh, Dorico's, um, you know, your, the settings that you have in your uh, notation options um, in, on, a, on more or less a case-by-case -case basis. So we'll get into that very shortly. Uh, the other three new features, uh, as we're calling them, or as you guys are calling them, uh, the dynamics lane. Uh, again, um, that would be in play mode, and play mode being a uh, another Dorico uh, only feature unique uh, to Dorico where it's kind of like a doll like uh, representation of the music where you can um, uh, basically see your music uh, in a uh, form that looks like a sequencer and it is representative of what the notation is but you can also make tweaks to it 
and uh, essentially override it to finely tune your playback without compromising the music notation or indeed adding any sorts of you know MIDI messages or anything. Is that more or less an accurate way of describing what play mode is? Absolutely right. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, <clears throat> and then the other two features, which I think more you know will probably at least conceptually be a little more familiar to uh, people, uh, certainly on the notation side, uh, bracketed note heads and uh, horizontal and vertical lines. Uh, so. Um, why don't we, uh, you know, maybe take them uh, in order? Why not? And uh, uh, start with condensing changes. And, and Daniel, if you want to uh, show us uh, how that's working in 3.1, what's new and, and what we can uh, uh, look to see. Yeah. So this is an arrangement that you actually sent me, Philip. So I've never <laughs> seen this music before. Nothing up my sleeves, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Yeah, no, that's um, a good, good disclosure for a number of reasons. But we've uh, we've put condensing on. And as you can see, so if you're if you're kind of used to this, if I switch to uh, galley view for a second here, which is what Dorico calls um, scroll view or panorama, as, as it was called in, in Sibelius. And you can see that obviously here's the score and everybody's on their own stave. Two flutes, two oboes, clarinets and A. Two bassoons, some horns, etc., etc., etc. But if we switch back to page view, you, um, you'll see that and, it's. And actually... I just I, and I just want to no note for people that may be uh, criticizing uh, the 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 setup. It's not something that it's not it's it's uh, this was an export from Sibelius uh, into Dorco. So certain things like where it says B flat trumpets and B flat. Yes, exactly. Weird, yes. weird things like that. Uh, this is for the purpose of demonstrating the, the condensing feature. So yes. uh, please save your comments uh, you know, for, <laughs> uh, for, for, for something else. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for making that clarification. Dorico would never be so stupid as to call a trumpet a B flat trumpet in B flat. How redundant. Yeah. Um, that would be, I guess that would be an A flat trumpet. Uh, I, anyway. I suppose it would <laughs> so um so as you can see now um here on on the first system uh obviously we've got the flutes are playing in unison so it automatically says atu uh whereas the clarinets are playing uh two two different you know bits of music at thirds and sixths apart effectively and you can see that dorico nicely you know works out when to label things here we've got two bassoons playing octave apart so they don't need any labels but they also have been amalgamated together there's not stems up stems down as you might be familiar with from from some of the other programs that well the one other program that makes any kind of attempt at, at this kind of thing which you sort of do in reverse where you write the music in condensed form and then you have uh, special rules for how you how you split the split the stuff out in the parts um but as you can see and and these are the sorts of things that you alluded to a moment ago when you were saying that there are options in the uh, notation options dialog for let's just make this a little bigger so people can see them a bit better for how those um, how the Dorico should approach the condensing. And we have these in 3.0, um, and we've added a few new ones, actually, in 3.1 in particular down here for inactive players. There's a whole other... I mean, we probably won't spend too much time thinking about this specifically, but just very quickly to say something about it. Um, there's sort of two approaches when you've got two players on a staff. Um, you can either show, as the left-hand example here is shown, when one of them isn't playing, so here, for example, player one is playing, it's a bit of Mazorkski, obviously, you recognise that figure, um, and player two isn't playing. So you can write this using natural stem directions, although, as it happens, there's no difference between the natural stem directions between the two examples, but and no rest, but then you need to label it to say one so that you can tell, oh, that's not a two, it's not both of the players, it's player one who's playing it. So you would label that there. And then when player two comes in, you would then um, show show their entry, then it stems up, stems down, or, or whatever it might be, and, and you label it that way. But the other way of doing it is, is, to, is to show rests, so you don't then need to label. So this gives you a way of balancing the requirements of, of needing labels, which are kind of one kind of visual noise, if you like, when you're reading the score, versus needing rests, which is another kind of visual noise when you're reading the score. So um, we had some simple support, which is this original option down here in Dorico 3.0, which would allow you to basically either, you know, just keep the pairings the same, so have players one and two together even if player two is not playing or to block out that player who's not playing and have him or her on his or her own staff so that then that can be hidden with empty staves or you can actually kind of not show anything other than just simply showing the number in the label so you see the two is there but this is one and three and then at that point you know the uh the, the music is is shown that way but this other approach is to say 
well, actually, that, that works fine for the whole system. But what this new set of features does is it then operates on, you know, phrases and within the system. And of course, as we'll come to in a moment with condensing changes, you can then change this over time. So the one kind of real limitation that condensing had, I think, I mean, there are there are still a couple of things that we would, even after 3.1, that we would really uh, and will continue to to work on. One of them is, is performance. You know, editing a score with condensing on is still very slow. Um, and that's because there's a lot of computation that goes on into uh, into doing condensing. Um, and we've so far continued to focus on rounding out the capabilities of the feature rather than focusing on the really difficult nitty gritty work of then getting in and optimizing it, which we are confident we'll be able to do, but it's gonna take a bit more time than we've, than we've had so far. Um, and if I can interject for just a second, yeah. Daniel, I mean, these are the types of things that if you are engraving a score um, and dealing with this music um, or any type of music, you're agonizing over each of these decisions. You're trying to think, you know, what is the way that I can convey clearly and without ambiguity uh, what is going on musically to the conductor? Because that is who is reading this or, you know, somebody, you know, studying the score. Because obviously this is not going to be performed from, you know, because each of the players will have their own separate parts. So you need to try to be as economical as possible while still conveying all the accurate information, both the entrance, the exit, you know, when both players are playing together, when one is resting, when the other is resting. And to take all those things into account, I mean, just the mental calculations that go involved. So it's not a surprise that uh, Dorico, I mean, there's a, like you said, this is just one, the tip of the iceberg. There are so many of these uh, types of decisions that it has to make. And so computationally, it's no surprise that uh, it, it takes a lot of, um, a lot of power to, to do that. And uh, why, you know, probably why it's never really been done in this way in any software. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and we, I think in general, you know, people feel like, um, you know, I, I mean, I, and I've talked a bit about this before, that Dorica's architecture is such that it is designed, you know, it's multi-threaded, it's all modern code, et cetera, et cetera. But um, the way that, you know, because everything it does, whether it's doing condensing, or whether it's just laying out the music normally, is doing sort of orders of magnitude more computation than, than previous generation scoring programs. And so, you know, the laws of physics being what they are, you can't do infinite amounts of work and still have the program respond in a thousandth of a second or whatever it might be, even on the most powerful computers. Because even if you're using, you know, we've done some testing, thanks to our friends at Apple on the new Mac Pro um, just before they came out. And those machines are beasts. They're absolutely crazy powerful. But there's still an overhead involved in actually marshalling the tasks and splitting them out onto the multiple cores. And depending on the nature of the edit that you're doing, there's actually what we've what we've sort of tended to find is there's a decent amount of overhead in actually setting up the threads, uh, you know, in order to go and do that work in parallel and then bring it all back together again. So it's, you know, it's, it's a very, very, you know, and, and this is all stuff that I really only have a very a veneer of knowledge about that there's people on our team of course who are you know thinking living and breathing this stuff every single day i i tend to i can do easy bits and i can think about how it should all work but the the detail of of, of the of the magic that the guys in the team uh sort of weave every day to make to make dorico work is is obviously far far beyond my my meager understanding but the the point is that um you know whether it's condensing or anything else dorico is doing more work than other programs because to get a better result it has to do more work that's that's kind of the nature of the beast and that's why you know i, I haven't actually counted how many uh, individual processes we had when i was writing the development diaries before dorica came out i would say oh yes we've got 100 engines or whatever it's probably 300 engines by now to do all the different tasks that dorica is doing and you know the program only continues to grow in sophistication um but we we do you know we take performance is a feature of any software whether it's dorica or anything else and so uh we do take it very seriously but it is easy you know if, if there are easy things we could do like oh make make it use more memory here or whatever we would do them uh, but but the truth of the matter is that we we've carefully designed dorico to to do the minimum amount of computation that it needs to do for any edit that you make but the real problem with condensing is that any edit that you make could affect the entire system in a way that just changing the pitch of a note when music's not condensed 
probably won't. But if you change the pitch of a note and it causes um, the you know the spacing to change in a dramatic way, that could change the entire condensation because it might be that it's the music at the boundaries of the system that's actually governing what the maximum condensation that's possible on that system is. You know because that's where the pitch crosses, and if the pitch doesn't cross, then actually that whole system could be written a completely different way. And so the you know and these of course as you say is what you alluded to a moment ago the mental gymnastics that the human editor has to go through to actually figure out how to cast off the music and balance yeah. what's going to be readable for the conductor to work with and what's the right balance between numbers anyway into this world comes condensing changes and the idea behind condensing changes is that all of these decisions that dorico is making you can now have some influence over it in terms of from here to here or from here on going basically take those notation options that we were just looking at and change them or you can even get to what we call manual condensing, which is where you can say to Dorico, never mind um, how you think these parts fit together or which staves these things should go on, do it this way. And so that is what condensing changes provide. So if you're the kind of, you know, what we hope is that the default result that Dorico gives you uh, will always be unambiguous. It's quite conservative, usually. Our defaults are quite conservative. We don't want the program to produce a result that you kind of puzzle over and scratch your head to say, well, why why is that note there? You know, who does that belong to? The idea is that it should be easy to read the score at a glance, even if it's not the maximum possible condensation at every point. And of course, the program can't ex exercise discretion in every single direction. You know, it can't, for example, or it won't, maybe we could one day make it do it, but it doesn't figure out the optimal page breaking and everything as well as all this. It sort of does it based on the constraints that it's got in terms of which bars it thinks can fit on the page and so on. So it's important that we give the user some additional control and that's what condensation changes starts to do so i'll just show you roughly how it works um, this will be a bit nonsensical but if we go for, well if i'll do it on the bassoons here so it, of course the, in fact condensation changes are i'm sorry condensing changes they're called they were called condensation changes for a while but we decided that we shouldn't have too many participles of the word condensing um, in the program so they're condensing changes um, you don't. You can only have one at a given position, but you can you can make them work across all of the groups that you've got. So if we go to condensing change, you just choose something at the point where you want it to go, and this slightly scary dialogue appears, and it's in basically two chunks. You've got the notation options, which are without the pretty pictures. That's the options that are on the condensing page of notation options, and then you've got the manual condensing section down here. And by default, nothing's activated. But if we, for example, select the bassoon group and enable that for a condensation change, even doing that actually changes something because that says to Dorico at this point where you've enabled this group for condensing now we're going to have a new phrase even if you're in the middle of a phrase and you know the sort of notion of phrases and condensing is a bit complicated but in simple terms what Dorico does for now is it just looks at any rest basically any rest in in the music then counts as the start of a phrase and it gets complicated because they can overlap because you might have two players who are kind of interwoven and so the phrases don't align and that has implications on how you can condense them and so on but in simple terms if you if you switch on that checkbox for any of these condensing groups, that means a new phrase starts here. And that might be enough. That might be enough for then Dorico to then look at the music that follows and say, well, I've got a clean slate here now. Given this material, what's the maximum condensation that's possible from here on out? So, um, so for instance, so if I had a phrase that ended on beat one and then another phrase that ended on, uh, that started on beat two, you're saying that in um, yeah, Dorico 3.0, it would have not considered those separate phrases, but in Dorico 3.1, I could, you know, say, hey, this is a new phrase, and it would take that into account. Exactly. So if, for example, okay. they were phrases that were delineated by slurs, but there wasn't actually right. an that's, actual that's rest, what I'm thinking. Yeah. exactly, then, then yes, Dorico would treat that as, a, as one phrase in 3.0. And, you know, we looked at using slurs for, fra you know, we, I mean, as you say, uh, we, we, we've been working on this for many years before you saw any of it in Dorico 3.0. And we've tried various things that balance, um, you know, giving Dorico enough flexibility to change things versus it not wanting to cast off huge scads of music every time you make any kind of change and and in the end we decided to opt for something that was simple which is that any rest even if it's a, an articulating rest in the middle of a phrase that is true you know because 
even if that is a, even if that is treated as a new phrase, often the character of the music, either side of that articulating rest, will be the same, which means that actually the condensation result would be the same either side of those rests. Whereas you've got a longer rest, of course, the character might change at that point, and then it, it makes sense for it to then obviously be able to think of that as a new phrase. So, but it, you know, one of the things that you might just try if you're not happy with the result that Dorica gives you for a given pair of instruments or set of instruments, just try switching on that checkbox and, and press OK. Now it won't do anything in this case because um the the bassoon um part is already you know there's not a great deal you could do there's only really a couple of options you could have here but what we can do for example is we could say that we we don't want to allow any amalgamation so amalgamation is when you have um chords with uh two notes in it say for two bassoons and the whole phrase can't be done as a unison um or isn't in rhythmic unison for example but some certain certain notes are so th this phrase obviously is actually in, in pretty much in rhythmic unison it's all dotted uh, half notes or dotted minims but there's uh because they're they're sometimes octaves and they're sometimes converge because obviously the range of the instrument um then you can amalgamate those ones but obviously the octaves still have to go that way but you can for example say you know one thing we could do is we could say we'll always show two voices say so we could actually do this with manual condensing we could go in here and we can say Add the bassoon to the upstem voice and then add the other bassoon to the downstem voice. And then when we press OK, then we'll actually see that this will be notated in a different way. Now we get stems up, stems down. It doesn't say atu. Instead, now we get stems up, stems down. Um, so that's a simple example. We could also do, for example, we could say that for whatever crazy reason, we don't want the clarinets to be condensed on the system. So we could then select the clarinets group and we could again say some manual condensing and say no condensing. And we don't have to do anything else apart from that. That will then just split the two clarinet parts out onto their own staves. And if we then wanted to bring them back together at the next entry, for example, here, we can create a new condensing change at this point. Um, and again, we can activate the clarinet part and then we can say, um, whoops, select the clarinet part and then say, uh, you know, reset, which means go back to whatever is normally happening, which in mm. this case will will then put them back um, on the same stave after a moment and label it one. So so you see, uh, I, you see the sorts yeah. of things that, that become possible with, with this feature. So, so this is actually a question that I um, had as I was working through this a little bit. The reset, um, if you turn on manual condensing and hit reset, that does that effectively override anything that you might have in the in the notation options area because it goes back to the uh, the the defaults of of the document? No, it, it's it's no. literally only for the condent for the actual way that the music is condensed in terms of whether you say what the allocation of instruments or players I should say to staves is or whether Dorico is allowed to determine it. I see. I see. So okay, so that's reset. not. A, I see. Okay. It's just for the actual manual condensing. So, so actually, the, the neat thing about right. this is that you can you could actually, for ex I mean, it's slightly head stretching to think about it in these terms. But you could, for example, in the first condensing change, you could change this option, and then in the second condensing change, you wouldn't set that. But that means that now, by the time you get to the second condensing change, rather than using the default value, it's using the prevailing value from the previous condensing change, whereas all the other ones that you didn't change in the previous condensing change, they're using the default options from the notation options dialog. So you've basically, you can imagine this is like sort of, if you like, I don't know how many options there are, there are a dozen basically, there's like 12 separate streams of options that are going through. And they're either using the last value or a new value or the original value. And it's, you know, that's what reset does. Reset says, go back to the options, the notation options. Change means give me a new value and not doing anything at all is like a pass through. And then it's basically saying whatever the value was at this point, Points where the condensing change is, whether keep it's it. coming from a previous change or from the originals, keep it. So mm -hmm. it's it's pretty sophisticated stuff, um, yeah, as sure this stuff always tends to be. Uh, but the, but the neat thing about it is that it means that again, you can also, and of course that's twelve separate streams of options per condensing group, because every one of these groups has its own set of options. So it's very 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 flexible, um, and and gives you a much much greater degree of control 
over the condensing result um, in Dorico 3.1 compared to 3.0. So I think the combination of, of this, the, the new condensing change thing, also the, the change that we, we talked about briefly in the notation options dialog for the uh, for the way that it handles inactive players, and also a separate change, which is, is kind of invisible in a way, which is how Dorico responds to phrases that begin with a rest um, is another big change. So in Dorico 3.0, if you, for example, had three flutes, and all of them began with some passage of rests, even if the music that then followed for all three flutes completely aligned and everything else, it would never get down to one stave. And that's because you couldn't condense rests onto, you know, couldn't condense rests belonging to multiple players into one rest. And so Dorica 3.1 removes that limitation as well, which means that now, even without changing anything else, even just by opening your project in Dorica 3.1, you may get a more condensed result than you got in 3.0.10 because we've enriched the way that it works. And various other things will be different as well. So for example, the way that where we add labels and what labels we add, if you have a group that consists of um, dissimilar instruments like trombone and tuba, for example, it will now correctly give you the short name of trombone and tuba rather than sometimes either nothing or just a one and another one because it's the first trombone and the first tuba, which is not very helpful. It doesn't really right. tell you anything. So there's many, many improvements across the whole of the feature um, in order to make it you know, richer and better. Uh, but I really do feel that, that condensing changes, you know, they, they take what was already, in our opinion, a pretty, you know, unique and, and very powerful feature that we hope will really improve the quality of, of, of what people are reading from when they're, when they're, you know, submitting music for competitions or for the concert stage, or even possibly if you're doing session stuff, it takes that, that feature and it gives you a whole other avenue of control and options um you know so yes you can't edit the music directly which some people have wanted and they, you know you can do certain things you can grab these dynamics and you can flip them above and below you can flip slurs and so on and so forth you know you can you can do things but uh obviously what you can't do is just get in there and edit the notation but condensing changes give you the give you the power to to change that notation you know, in, in lots of in lots of interesting and, and, and useful ways. Uh, so we think it really it really sort of takes condensing. I mean, obviously, in, in an ideal world, we would have had condensing changes in 3.0, but now here they are in 3.1. It's a free update for anybody who's got Dorico 3, um, and we think it'll it'll really make condensing even more powerful and useful to people. That's great, and uh, it's important to know that condensing uh, ch uh, condensing options live in the notation options uh, and they are um, uh, specific to each flow. Am I getting that right? Exactly right, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, so you could have different condensed and that obviously makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, you know, we think of a flow more or less as a movement. I know there are lots of other uses for it as well, but uh, if you, you know, certainly you can think of the musical content of your composition uh, changing quite significantly from movement to movement, from flow to flow, and you might decide to, um, you know, have a six part uh canon of, of the, the the brass for instance of the horns uh in in one movement and then the other one right uh, completely homophonically and uh these types of options are designed uh, I, I imagine more or less with that type of scenario in mind exactly so yeah that's exactly yeah. right okay. yeah. yeah and and now you can do that not only on a flow by flow basis but effect, effectively you're bringing the that um capability to the same flow uh, and not only with within different sections of the flow, but also uh, on a uh, instrument or a group by group basis. Exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Okay. Um, so good. Well, we... I, I, yeah, I see that you've got play mode up. Uh, let's talk about uh, the next new feature, which is the dynamics lane in play mode. Absolutely. So, so we've had these three buttons for a little while. Obviously, this was a new one in in Dorico three. The automation lane for the plane techniques lane. Sorry, I beg your pardon. The velocity lane was new in Dorico three. We had the automation lane Dorico two. Um, so you've got velocity editor, which is this one. You've got the um, the automation editor, which is this one, which is you know familiar to anybody who's used a sequencer. But the dynamics editor is different from the uh, from the 
MIDI automation editor because it's kind of abstract. It doesn't necessarily edit one thing. It edits whatever Dorico is using to play the dynamics at that point. So imagine a violin, for example. Um, typically, when you're playing back through a virtual instrument, the, the bowed sounds, you know, the, the normal sustained sounds, they're going to be played back with something that uses some kind of continuous controller for, for volume, whether it's channel volume, channel expression, modulation, whatever it might be, which, of course, is normally defined in the expression map, which is, you know, Dorico's way of understanding the capabilities of a sound library in terms of how to get at the different sounds, how to how to get the most out of, out of the sounds. But when you're pizzicato, for example, that is typically going to be velocity control, just like any other percussive um, instrument would be, uh, because obviously you can't generally get louder as you play a pizzicato note, um, generally. I'm sure somebody's figured out a way of doing it with like electric feedback or something, but generally speaking, <laughs> you can't get louder when you're, when you're playing a plucked note. So... Um, dynamics, the concept of dynamics, of course, means that it has to be able to translate between those two or N different ways of playing dynamics over time based on where this voice is going, whether it's using a sustaining sound or a percussive sound and so on and so forth. So rather than editing, for example, velocity to control the pizzicato notes and controller one modulation to edit the sustained dynamic, Dorico instead prevents you, presents you with a dynamics lane. And what that does is it shows, there are actually a huge number of dynamics in here, but this shows the dynamics and you can just about see, it's very titchy, but there's a point on the line here. Um, this middle line is if you like kind of mezzo forte as it were, and then this is FFF, that's PPP. So there's piano, there's another piano there at the beginning of that phrase. There's a hairpin. Um, crescendo mp so you see that it goes then from dynamic level minus one which is p to sort of minus a half which is mp um and and so on and so forth so and of course the nice thing about this is these are all editable points so i can grab this initial dynamic and without changing the forte that's marked in the score i can make it ff and that's still displaying as forte in the score but in playback it's going to be translated into whatever is needed to to play that back as a fortissimo. And I can write in my own data um, if I want to with the pencil tool. And another thing that's new in Dorico 3.1 is that these points can now be linear rather than constant. And the difference between a constant point and a linear point is that obviously a linear point means that, it's, uh, is that it goes from one value to the other smoothly, whereas a constant point stays at the value that you chose until the next one. So it kind of looks stepped versus looking like a curve. It, it, it sm smoothes it, sm smooths it out, yeah. That's right, it sort of interpolates the values between the points so that it will, as it goes through, it will discretize the, the curve, as it were, to, to sort of put in intermediate values when it, when it renders out in playback. So that's very important for things like, for example, pitch bend, where you wouldn't want to hear a very sort of jaggy <laughs> pitch bend. You want to hear something that's, right. as you know, sort of interpolated as you can now again i've written in so there's effectively a whole scads of dynamics there now none of those will appear in right mode at all they don't even get signposts um dorico stashes the way stashes them away in a special area where it then combines the ones that are written in the in, the, in right mode with the ones that you draw in in the dynamics editor in in play mode and renders them all down into a single stream of dynamics when it goes and of course you also have the line tool and when you do something with the line tool you get you just get a linear you know gradation from value one to value two over whatever time that you choose and of course you can grab each of those points and you can move it up and down so that now goes you know fortissimo pianissimo um fortissimo for example over the, over the course of those bars and you can change the length of it and you see that also the the range is highlighted to show you that that is one unit because if that was long enough or you were zoomed enough close in enough, you might not know what's actually happening. You know, are we part of a, of a range here or not? Um, and so it, it's as simple as that, basically. It's very, very simple to sort of understand that then what you what you now have is not only individual control over every note start position, end position, and velocity, and also you can write in arbitrary MIDI controllers just like you would in the sequencer. You now have additional control over the overall dynamic level of the instrument, which is, you know, velocities and things will still be applied on top of that. Any velocity edits that you make, any controller edits that you make will still be applied on top. But it gives you a really nice way of, of finessing a performance of, you know, you can take a message of Oce hairpin, for example, and change the inflection point, change the, the amount by which it grows and, and shrinks. And of course, it's worth pointing out that in fact, previous versions of Dorico didn't actually play them back properly. It would actually only play the first half. It would play the mm. crescendo bit, but not the diminu diminuendo bit. And we also have, if I just go to the go to the score here quickly and put in, you know, a sforzando, for example, 
via the popover um, and then come back into into play mode um, so we're in bar 15 so actually now these um, combined or forced dynamics that that have kind of an attack and then a return to another value they also now have these little envelopes so you can now change the intensity of the attack of that sports ando and indeed the ramp so it can either hit it directly on the attack or it can grow quickly to the to the level, then stick around at whatever level you want um, at the top, and then return to the original level um, at, at the end. So again, you have a lot of a lot of additional control now. And if you just open up, you know, just open up some Mozart or something that, that's written for for winds and has got sforzandos and things in it, it's quite a striking difference as to even without any sampled sforzandos in your sample library. Although it's worth pointing out that with the work that Paul has done on this, now if you do have a Sforzando sample in your library, it can be triggered by a Sforzando dynamic in the score. But even without that, just using note perform or even using the Halian sounds, having this dynamic manipulation within the space of a note by, by Dorico riding the controllers effectively can produce some pretty, um, you know, there's a certain verisimilitude to it. I wouldn't claim, you know, it's not going to sound like the Berlin fill or anything, but but it's going to it's going to give you a little bit more a bit more life and a bit more light and shade in in the music. And you know, so the tools are there if you want to mess with it. But the nice thing about it is that it also allows us to then give you better, more lively dynamic playback out of the box as well. And for those of us that, that care about such things, the uh, Sforzando is within the dynamic. So if you have if the prevailing dynamic is piano. It would be a sforzando that would be within piano, or um, do you know what I'm saying? Like, it does yeah. it go? To, it doesn't go. It's yeah. not an absolute dynamic. It doesn't leap up to uh -huh. forte. No, it, right. it sort of goes up by one or two dynamic levels. Mm -hmm. So, if you're at piano, it would go up to kind of mezzo forte. If you're at mezzo forte, it goes to fortissimo, that kind of thing. Um, I see. And and so and again you can you can tweak it all so so yeah it's 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 pretty nice and um, yeah. you know Paul's worked really hard on it and also as as part of this there's as I say the the overhaul in terms of how um, the automation points work the difference between constant and linear points um, there's some other nice playback improvements uh, that we probably won't have time to really cover but you know Dorico can now play back harmonics automatically so you know we added the the notation of harmonics in three point naught where you could write um you know write the written pitch and then it would figure out the sounding pitch by showing the appropriate you know diamond a fourth above a fifth above whatever it would be depending on which partial you you happen to be targeting uh but it didn't do anything in playback but in 3.1 now re again regardless of whether or not your sample library has a harmonic sound it will use it if it does have one um, and you define it in the expression map um but it will now actually play the correct pitch without you having to run any plugins or do any kind of hiding of MIDI messages or anything else that you might be used to from certain other programs, you can now just write the harmonic, Dorica will play exactly what you want to hear. And it supports, you know, several different conventions in terms of, you know, natural harmonics written either as the the O above the above a regular note head or just writing the diamond note head to mean, you know, which partial you're touching on whichever string. And you'd obviously normally write sort of Sol G or Sol D or whatever as well as that. And Dorico doesn't yet write that label on its own, but we're thinking about maybe making it do that in the future. Plus of course the artificial harmonics notation with the with the stop pitch and the touch pitch. So where you finger the string and where you then touch the string to then produce whichever harmonic you're expecting. All of those are notated without any workarounds and they will play back without any workarounds as well. So that's a, that's a pretty nice improvement. And, and again, as far as I know, the only scoring program that has any feature like that out of the box. Mm -hmm. Nice. And uh, to be clear, that's a separate feature from the uh, play uh, lane, the dynamics lane that you're showing, this, that you're showing us right now. Uh, that is yet another, uh, it, what you're technically calling an improvement, but uh, we could also call it a new feature uh, or an enhanced feature of the harmonics that you uh, were building on on, on 3.0. And before we leave dynamics lane, just to reiterate the, one of the first things that you said, Daniel, is that I think it is important. People look at this type of uh, representation, those of us that are not used to working with uh, DAWs, with sequencers, as much as notation software, we start getting scared about things like MIDI messages, or we start getting scared about things like the the uh, controller, uh, different controllers, and which one controls this. And like you said, is it a velocity uh, control? Is it a uh, you know a mod wheel control? You don't have to worry about that. You just have to basically you're just drawing in dynamics and letting Dorico figure out what is uh, applicable, what's appropriate for the particular instrument that it's working on. 
That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. You know, the, the idea is that we want to give people the the control to get in there and muck around with it with themselves, you know, with with their own sort of um, expertise and so on. But also, you know, I mean, I must say when I'm using Dorica myself for all my choral work, I almost never go into play mode because, you know, you, you hear the notes, the nice new Olympus choir micro sounds we had in version three sound sound a lot better than the than the ones we were using before. Um, you can just, you know, get a decent idea of how it works. And with these new uh, improved uh, sort of more responsive dynamics as well it, you know it, it sort of just sounds it just sounds better so um, yeah you can ignore it all you never need to come into play mode if you don't want to but it is as you say it's kind of a, a unique thing that dorico offers that no other professional scoring program offers something with this level of, of sophistication and you know of course it is it's one of the one of the directions that we continue to work hard in because you know all sorts of different types of uh, of, of musical project require you to come up with increasingly good playback and we'd like as far as we can get towards that you know we, we try very hard to make the effort involved in in producing good printed materials we want to reduce that as far as we possibly can save you as much time as we can we'd like to be able to do the same thing on, on the playback side as well so yeah. this is all more and more steps in that direction and if you've stuck with us in the now, now, now seven, seven, seven minute, minute, minute of our, of our video, video you'll, you'll, you'll uh, 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 remember uh, that, that earlier, earlier uh, in the hour we were talking, talking about what we call, call, call the software, software, software we're calling it music notation software I just heard you refer to it as a scoring program and of course you know this is much more in the scoring area than the music notation side but of course, there, course there, you know, you're, you're, you're getting, getting to, 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 to be two sides of the same coin as a point. So, so yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, good. Uh, well, you know, well, back to the notation uh, side uh, of things. Side if we could uh, move on to what we would be calling maybe the third uh, new feature, and that would be um, the bracketed note heads. And this is something I think that a lot more people, um, you know, using notation software might be familiar with. But of course, uh, in Dorico, we would expect and, and are uh, probably treated to uh, the type of thing where uh, it's doing it in its own thoughtful and detailed and unique way. So let's have a go with that. Yeah. So, um, so as you say, there's there's a few a few sort of nifty things about it. So, um, <clears throat> you know, Sibelius does this very nicely um, as well, uh, and we um, obviously want to try and make sure that we we do this as well as we as well as we possibly can. So I'm just going to do a couple of just get a couple of different situations going here so that we've got something to look at. So, um, so you can do this a number of ways. You can, for example, select a whole chord um, like that, and then you can either go to the properties panel, but actually the, the probably the better way to do it is there's a menu item, um, and you can just say toggle around brackets, and as you see, Dorico then produces brackets, and of course these all update as the as the as the music changes. You know, you've got um, separate brackets for all the <laughs> unisons there, if, uh, if that's what floats your boat. Um, and you can also have square brackets brackets as well if you prefer so if we were to in fact what's interesting is if i do that with that one selected note you'll see that you can actually have just that one note um, surrounded by square brackets and then dorico will cleverly try to figure out what's the what's the most compact arrangement it can come up with for um for the others so then let's make things more difficult by adding some accidentals as well and you see that dorico handles that pretty nicely let's make this whole chord dotted uh, which it might actually, um, it does work okay. So, you know, this is all, you know, and it, it just kind of, it just works basically. That's the nice thing about it. You don't really have to think about it. If we um, if we put it on here, so if I just toggle that on there, this can now actually show us two things. So one thing is that once you get more than an octave, it will automatically break, you know, an octave in terms of the distance between the notes, it will break them. Of course, there are oodles of options for this on the new bracketed note heads page of engraving options. So you can say, for example, this one here, if you wanted it to break when the gap between them is a little smaller, it will do that now when there's five stars positions between them rather than eight staff positions um, so you can you can do that but you can also do things like this where you can select an individual note head go to the properties panel and say break brackets and that will then start a new bracket at this point so if i then carry on building this chord uh, by adding other notes above of course they they don't have the brackets yet uh, but if i select those notes and then make them bracketed then they get included in the bracket and even if i move this note closer they will still get a separate bracket because you've told the program that that note that g that g5 there as it were should be the the starting note of a, of a new bracket and the other thing is that how it handles tied notes um you can you can make 
this bracketed and because we want to make it possible to have any note in a tie chain be bracketed because for various editorial reasons or whatever you might need just one note in the tie chain to be bracketed but you might also just want to say bracket until the end of the tie chain and then the nice thing about this is that if i then for example go back here and uh, if i go into insert mode and make that back into um, an eighth note, then you'll see, oh, of course, I forced duration on this. Well, if I unforce it, and you see that even as the, the notation changes, with that property set, that bracket will always end at the right-hand side of the of the tie chain rather than on, on one note. And again, as far as I know, no other software has any feature like that where you can bracket the start and the end of a tied note separately. Um, so so that's a, that's another feature that's, that's unique to Dorico. And again, it's worth reminding our viewers uh, and uh, readers that that is because Dorico is thinking of that, uh, you know, those two notes as really one note uh, and representing them in a way notationally. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, it's, you know, if you were to rebeam this or to re-meter it, um, it would recombine that depending on, you might, it might represent it as an, as a dotted quarter note. It might represent it as an eighth note tied to a quarter, depending on, uh, the, um, you know, the, the beaming options and whatever you chose to do. But the Dorco is always considering those two notes, um, part of the, you know, one, one underlying, uh, duration at the end of the day. Exactly, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So, you know, it's pretty simple, but it's but it's nice. And just one other thing while we're in the area, um, the other thing that we've added in this version um, is that you can now also bracket accidentals in square brackets, which wasn't possible before. You could do them in round brackets, but of course, editorial practice, if you're doing a critical edition or something, would often dictate that you needed square brackets. So we now have square brackets for accidentals as well as part of this. And this also incidentally works on tab as well. So if, you, if you're writing, um, you know, for guitar and you want to show particular i mean obviously dorico by default for example will show tied notes in parentheses that's you know that's often or round brackets or whatever you want to call them that's often how it would be done you know for the for the tied two notes in a tie chain for example uh, but you can also independently have notes bracketed in the notation stave and in tablature if you want to as well so um it, it's again you know it's just there's nothing much to it other than it's simple to do a huge amount of work, I mean, a huge amount of work went into all the collision avoidance and everything to make sure that um, it would always look good regardless of whatever sort of complicated situation that you that you put it in. Um, I'm not saying that it's completely, uh, that you can never fox it, but you, you can, you'll can you have to try quite hard to fox it. And you can also then go into engrave mode and you can, you know, obviously nudge the entire bracket left and right. You can also get hold of the ends and you can move them up and down. And as you see, Dorica will actually continue to try and adjust other things in order to make that work. When you do this, you adjust the, the overall curvature of the bracket. It's always symmetrical, which is why there's only one handle in the middle rather than giving you full Bezier style control. Um, but as you see, you know, you've got all the flexibility that you could want. Um, even the square brackets, of course, still provide you with two handles, so you can make them taller or shorter, and you can also move them left and right as well um, if you need to. So so it provides you with a, a lot of a lot of power and control, um, you know, in the spirit of giving you um, a great result by default without you having to lift a finger other than just say, I want this note head or this chord to be bracketed, uh, but also then giving you the power and flexibility that you need to do whatever you know, detailed work um, is is important to you for whatever the project might be. Terrific. Uh, great. Well, look, uh, this is uh, yet another, uh, you know, feature that is squarely focused on the engraving side of things um, and uh, notationally speaking. Uh, the final one, uh, at least the final major new feature in Dorico uh, 3.1, of course, is the uh, horizontal and vertical lines. And this is one I, you know, I'd love to get your take on because uh, we're thinking, well, wait a second, you know, we have already sorts of all sorts of lines that were already in Dorico, whether they be arpeggios or crescendo uh, ha hairpins and so on. And of course, you know, the, the, the difference is that uh, lines in what we may be thinking of uh, as, as lines in another software is, uh, is not quite the same thing in Dorico. So uh, perhaps you could uh, use that as a jumping off point to tell us about this, uh, what's going on here. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think the the interesting thing about about this is this is maybe the first feature that we've added in Dorico where we don't have a specific, um, with a couple of exceptions, we don't really have a specific semantic thing in mind for this. You know, and and basically what you know we've added 
as you've already said, you know, dynamics, they, they require lines of various kinds, you know, things like obviously hairpins, you can think of them as lines because they are effectively two angled lines, but also things like crescendo poco a poco, which again, you might, you know, you might do that in another program and it wouldn't be a dynamic. It would just be something you create in a, an expression editor or a line editor or something, and it wouldn't necessarily know that it was a dynamic. And so, some of the things that in, say, for example, Sibelius, where you would need to define lines, you don't need to do that in Dorico because Dorico already implements those line-like things as their own first-class citizen semantic musical object, whether it's a, a pedal line, whether it's a glissando line, whether it's you know um, a jazz articulation, whatever it might be. All of those things kind of have their musical place. Um, and of course, in, in Dorica 3.0, we introduced the idea of continuation lines for playing techniques. Again, another thing that the other programs don't really have. If you want to go sol ponza sol tasto, you can write those two text instructions or symbols if you want to use the symbols, and then join them with an arrow. And the program will do that automatically um, and understand the transition between them, which again, is something you can cobble together with the available tools in the other notation programs, but they're not one item that then mm. move as one and are grouped together as one and if you drag the saltasto the arrow will follow it and things like this the, these things just don't happen in, in other software so but the the nice thing about doing that playing techniques work is that it then gave us you know andrash the developer who, who worked on it for a good part of, of the last year um he effectively kind of then developed as part of that a kind of generic line drawing sort of set of of code that we could use um you know so and possibly should have done it to begin with so that we could have used it for all the different types of lines in various combinations but we now have this kind of this engine that can do lines of various kinds and so uh, what we wanted to then use that for is is basically giving people a few more options for creating lines that we don't necessarily have a fixed idea about what they're really meaning but which um, nevertheless are often used. You know, you might have all sorts of things. You know, if we're talking about um, Renaissance music, you might indicate a hemiola with a, with a horizontal bracket over over the, the music that is, you know, threes against twos or whatever it might be. Or if you're, in, if you're writing keyboard music, you, there's hand indicators that show when a chord is, is split between hands. And, you know, in the fullness of time, I'd actually quite like Dorico to add those automatically and, and to figure out that, you know, based on the fact that this is up here and there's other notes above it, it would actually be worth putting the, the little sort of upside down L to show that these notes are played by the left hand. But in the absence of all of those features right now, we can nevertheless give the user quite a lot of interesting tools and quite powerful tools to create lines of various kinds um, directly in the program, either, you know, again, in two categories, basically either horizontal, meaning as it happens, those that have a rhythmic duration, those that sort of last for more than one beat in the music or vertical ones meaning they sort of enclose notes in a chord a bit like the, the brackets that we were that we were looking at just a minute or two ago so if i've opened up the lines panel here and again unusually this doesn't have a popover and the reason for that is that these things don't have musical meaning as such so what would we what would we type into the popover to create them you know so <laughs> let's create a vertical one to begin with so if i if i just create one of these say so this is a bit like the existing non arpeggio line meaning don't spread this chord <laughs> and you see if i cross that to the stave below it follows um it uh, will separate it if it needs. That's interesting because, of course, I've now given it a stupid pitch because I crossed it to the stave below um, and then did all this ridiculous octave transmission, which is slightly cruel of me. Uh, but if you just do something a little bit more sensible, then then you don't get um, such random results. And, you know, the nice thing, again, is that this is fully customizable. So if, for example, you wanted to say um, that the there should be no start cap now you've got something that looks a bit like one of those hand indicators and of course in engrave mode you can you can grab hold of it and you can move it around you can make it um, less tall and in fact you don't have to do all of this purely graphically you've also got these controls here which control the staff position that it's attached to so if you have if you have a note you know, on, on staff position one, as we would call it, which is this one here. And then you would specify that the line should be four. That means four above that note. So if we if we move this note, which we, whoops, not going to play back. If we move this note, then the line actually still moves, keeps its delta in relation to the note, but it's a semantic delta rather than a graphical one, uh, which means that also it will automatically work out whether it would collide with a staff line, for example, and move it by a quarter of a space to avoid the staff line. Um, and, and so it's, it's 
things like that that just make it very, you know, very, very simple to do. And there's not many styles in here. As you can see, we've got a handful. You can have an arrow or whatever. And if you want to make that a downward pointing arrow, you just activate the reverse property and then it goes goes down like that. But you can also do things like, um, I'm upsetting it now, you can add text. So, for example, if I write hello on this line, you can see that it then actually puts that centered on the line like that. And that can be any, I don't have to define a new line if I want different text. I can just put the text on there on that individual instance and I can have it either left of the line or centered on the line or right of the line. And if I reverse the line, then it will also flip the text around the other way and uh, and so on. So there's a lot of flexibility in this. I can also change the body. If I want the body to be wiggly, I can do that. Um, it doesn't draw text when it's wiggly, but if I use, for example, a wedge, it will still draw text. So if we have a wedge body, uh, flat bottom wedge body, you know, so there's a lot of a lot of power and flexibility in in these in these tools. So you know, you could have one of those, for example. I don't know what that would mean, but I'm sure somebody <laughs> will come up with something exciting for that to mean. So you've got <laughs> quite a lot of control, and obviously, in, in the fullness of time, we also anticipate giving you an editor where you could actually define your own line styles from scratch rather than just using the repertoire that that we provide so if we then have a look at horizontal ones if we select a range like this we can create a line like this and this line um, can be flipped above or below the stave and also inside the stave which is quite interesting so if you wanted to again in the fullness of time i fully anticipate that dorico will have proper features for things like you know aleatoric frames with with lines that extend out to say when that cell should be played until we absolutely anticipate adding proper features to do that in a semantic way that would even play back and give you some kind of random -y sort of cell type playback as you go but in the absence of that you can you know you can do fun things like have one of these and then also at the same position you could have one of these um, and then you could put them both in the stave so like this and then you've got that. What does that mean? Well, it could be a cluster, you know, whatever. Um, and these lines are all editable by rhythmic position. So you could even probably draw a nice Christmas tree, I suppose, if you um, if you move them um, in interesting ways like this. And they automatically know how to position themselves relative to notes. And, you know, they, they get out the way. If we had rhythm dots, let's see if I can persuade it to show me a rhythm dot. Oh, I can't unless I change the, oh, the wrong position in the bar for the... Ah, anyway, um, you can, you can, um, you can, you know, it will move out the way of rhythm dots. They will avoid uh, if you sort of have it coming up to a bar line. It will know what to do. In fact, we had just had a couple more bars here. Um, if I add, let's say, four more bars. One of the nice things about the horizontal lines is that they actually have. I'm just going to move your little window, which is on top of my window here. You've got these controls at the top, which actually decide how the note should be. Um, how the line should behave. So if, for example, I create a, a note here, I select these two notes, then I press these two and then do this, then I get an arrow between those notes. And that's, you know, that's a line that, that automatically follows where that note goes. Um, and if I move that note, it will keep pointing at it and so on. And again, if I want to, I can add text to that line as well. Hello, and I can make it either in the middle, or I can have it um, on the top, or I can have it below. Um, and again, very powerful in engraved mode. I can then set that to have an erasure as well if it if it needs to, so that it blanks out the um, the stave lines. So that's one type of attachment. And then the other two are if I have just put a couple of whole notes in here, very quickly. Oh. Oxy below would probably be better, but okay. Um, so if I now, for example, set this to bar line attached, and then with that note selected, create a line like that, you can see that it snaps exactly to the bar line. And if I then change the bar line here to be a double bar line, it snaps automatically to that. And if I change it to an end repeat bar line, it sets correctly to that. And if I change it to be a start end repeat bar line, it snaps to the middle like that. And so these bar line attached lines then snap cleverly to whatever bar line is there. And again, you can have a start cap on it if you want to. So if you want a downward pointing hook, um, inward pointing axis aligned hook. The difference between axis aligned and rotatable, of course, is that if the line ends up skew if, because of course you can rotate this line if you want to, you know, and whether or not the whether or not the endpoints should remain horizontal or whether they should whether they should you know whiz up into into space or, or rotate with the with the um, with the line as it angles. So you've got that bar line attached line, and then I can also have a note attached line, which is or just a rhythmic attached line, I should say, which is which would be this one, and then that one, as you see. I can choose whether it should end immediately after this um, line, 
which is horizontal end position, or it should end there. And again, it knows whether it should cross the bar line and, and so on and so forth. So if we had some more notes in this bar, if I just change that to, yeah, of course, it's going to use the octave above because the previous notes in the octave above. If we if we now move this like this, you can see that I can now, for example, make it end there. Or if I drag it to the next note, it will end there. But I can also make it end there and if i then of course in in grave mode i can make it end absolutely wherever i like and these can go over system breaks and they can have their own vertical positions and so on so you know because you can then also modify the start cap the end cap the text in the middle and the style of the of the of the line itself you can specify how it attaches to rhythmic positions to bar lines or indeed to notes you can add text to it and have that centered on the line above the line below the line it's a and of course you can also flip the thing into the stave and then have a thick one for example if we made that a sort of thick um, line have we got a thick line solid line body thick you know with an arrow on the end of it you you can do all sorts of things and in fact one other trick that one of our beta testers was quite enamored of is that you can have a note and you can then have a line so for example you could just have a line with a with a terminal sorry um, with one that is note attached at the beginning and rhythmic attached at the end and that will then do this and then for example you could make it thick um, uh, if we look for solid thick, there we are. And then as you move this note up and down, that line just stays with it, which gives yeah. you the possibility of doing, you know, various kinds of things for proportional notation and so on. So it's um, it's a pretty powerful set of tools, and uh, we plan to make it more powerful still with the addition of an editor so that you can define your own line styles in, in a future version of the program. But even without the editor... Um, the fact that we've, as I say, got effectively four different types of lines, these, these vertical ones that, that enclose some or all notes of a chord and can go cross stave and can even go between instruments as long as instruments are held by the same player. And then these three different kinds of horizontal lines, either notes attached, either or both ends, and then rhythmic position attached and bar line attached, all of which can be customised, all of which can be tweaked in engraved mode. It, it's really a, a pretty powerful set of tools for, for drawing lines in your scores. You know, it's interesting. Um, I, I was just encountering this in another piece, and what you've just done there uh, actually has a, a pretty well accepted musical meaning. I mean, it does. You know, it, de it depending on uh, uh, who you consult uh, uh, on this, but uh, certainly uh, we all know uh, Elaine Gould's um, behind. Uh, bars, and she describes the various meanings that are ascribed to a solid, thick line like you've drawn with a terminal ending versus what a waving line uh, might mean versus one with an arrow uh, that might continue on the next system and so on. And so, uh, you know, it's interesting that, um, you know, these are now available to us uh, in Dorico and do, and they behave as we would expect. And we're not just, you know, even though, you know, they don't have quite the semantic meaning that you've um, assigned to them in the program, uh, the fact is because you have um, made it possible to have a note attached, uh, you know, a, a, a note attachment at one end and uh, uh, like you've just done here, uh, a position attached at the other or a bar line attached at the other, make it possible to still you know, put these things in with a, a pretty high degree of understanding that Dorco has behind it, and, and rather than just dropping in a random graphical line and not knowing what to do with it. So, um, it, it 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 strikes me that it's it it is almost like the playing techniques feature, uh, the grouped playing techniques feature that is minus the you know assignment of a playing technique essentially. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely, and as I say, none none of this also precludes us from adding semantic versions of this feature right. so like you say elaine gould does describe um in the later chapters of behind bars a number of these kind of techniques in terms of how they're used by more contemporary art, art musicians and art composers so absolutely and, and none of this stops us from having a proper feature for clusters in the future or a proper feature for hand separator or a proper feature for indicating hemiolas or whatever it might be sure but the uh, but the nice thing about it is that in the absence of all of those features now um, even regardless of when we do have them, the simple fact is that particularly with, with you know, contemporary composition, composers have need of 
graphical things that we as the software developers couldn't necessarily anticipate in advance what the meaning of that is going to be and so you know as, as people have seen you know, people will often say about dorico that you know oh, maybe it's not as customizable as, as other software well okay it's got 2000 engraving options it's got um, a music symbols editor a playing tickets editor a note heads editor it's got fully um uh, editable paragraph styles um, it's got graphics. You can bring note heads can be SVGs, blah blah blah. You know, so yeah, okay. It may not be, may not be that absolutely every aspect of of the score can be customized, but increasingly more and more and more can. Um, and you know, we think that the the lines feature again is another sort of signal of the fact that you know, yes, semantics are very important to Dorica. They're absolutely central to the philosophy behind the program. They are central to how we approach the design and the implementation of every feature that goes into the software. If we don't know why a user wants to add a marking to a score, how the heck are we supposed to implement it in terms of making it make musical sense and do something when it's in a part or do something when it's transposed or all the things that you're used to having to basically fart about with in other software because they don't make any effort to learn um, or to model what the semantic meaning behind those behind those things um, is. So, uh, you know, that is, as I say, completely crucial, central to what we're doing in the software but that doesn't mean that there isn't also the need for you know free expression as it were and so you know people often say oh why don't you just put illustrator into Dorica it's like well illustrator is its own program that's been around for 30 odd years you know we can't just put illustrator into Dorico but we can you know over time we can we can grow the customization, the the sort of non-semantic graphical side of the program, or at least where you as the user might ultimately even be able to assign your own semantic meaning, say, for example, in, you know, it should play this note or it should trigger this MIDI event or whatever. There's no reason why, as the software develops, we can't move more in that direction. Uh, but, you know, all of that still being in Dorico's future with the with the tools that we've added in Dorico 3.1, it nevertheless greatly expands the graphical capabilities of the program. And as you say, we've done it in a way that, you know, at least tries to be useful and handle the musical things so that, you know, when the spacing changes, the line moves. When the note pitch changes, the line moves, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it's been it's been a huge amount of work that Andrash has, has, has pretty much done on his own, bless him. Um, and he's really been working on lines, uh, you know, the engine to do this, then group playing techniques, and then this is basically Andrash's 2019. But I think it's a year that's been that's been very well spent, and it will ba- pay dividends in not only the fact that we'll be able to, you know, add an editor to to make lines of your own design in hopefully the relatively near future, but as I say, this engine for drawing lines will be able to use for for every other notation that might need something like this um, as we as we continue to develop the software into the future. Well, I think that's a good way to uh, end our conversation because uh, you know you've set it up nicely. Uh, telling us about all the, you know, at least the major new features. I mean, I'm sure we could go on for yet uh, another uh, couple hours on all the quote unquote minor features that are in uh, 3.1. But for that, um, we will, or at this, at the point at which this video is released, we we should have a, a review of 3.1 uh, up uh, on scoring notes where we'll uh, try to cover as many of those as we possibly can. Uh, you throw a lot of uh, at us, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as possible uh, in the in the time that we have. But uh, uh, you know, in terms of setting up Dorco for 2020, uh, and uh, you know the new features in 3.1, would you say that this is? Can you can you say that this is the last major uh, update to version three? Is that it's the plan? What, that's the plan. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know, plans are plans are dangerous things. Um, sure. Uh, you can't really plan too far ahead in, in this business, but but yeah, the, the plan is that we'll we'll now be able to turn our attention to to the next version of you know the sort of next major version of Dorico, whatever and whenever that may be, um, and you know. Obviously, if, if it turns out that for whatever reason we need to patch up some stuff that's uh, that's been in, in this version, then of course we'll do that. Uh, we'll never rule it out completely. But yes, our, our plan is to is to now start focusing on the next 
set of features and obviously there'll be you know many of them will will continue um the work that we've started you know condensing is certainly by no means um able to do everything we would like it to do yet and as as i've already indicated with the lions feature there's still more for us to do there play mode continues to be a focus of, of evolution in the software and we have you know many more plans to increase the utility and the flexibility and the power of, of that and every other part of the program so you know as I say, the one thing I can safely say after having done this for, you know, what can now be decades is that there is unfortunately no shortage of, of, of more things to do. And we will be very busy for uh, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, look, I mean, there's a lot to uh, enjoy here to take stock of. And uh, I hope you have at least a little bit of a chance to uh, enjoy it. Uh, and um, I, are you feeling that uh, that at least you know, once in a while, do you get to look back and say, hey, wait a second, you know, this is something, I mean, look at basically what started as more or less an idea as a kernel has now grown into something so robust and so complex. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, complex, sophisticated, sophisticated difficult, yeah. um, scary, uh, <laughs> all of these things. But yeah, I mean, we, we, we love it. You know, but this is the, you know, they always say, if you find a job that you love, you don't work a day in your life. And I'm not sure I've, some of the days over the last few years have certainly felt like work. Um, but, but no, on the whole, you know, yes, it, it's obviously every time we come to a release, it is always, it is always very gratifying to, to look back at the, at the strides that we've taken. And, and when you think that, you know the uh, the things that we've that we've added here. You know, obviously, apart from things like condensing, which were in flight for for years, effectively even before Dorico 1.0 was was released. Um, you know, the, these are things that we've that we've you know obviously thought about a great deal over over the preceding you know months and years. But to actually then implement them and get them shipping is is you know that's the that's the that's the thrill of it basically. You know, an idea isn't worth a huge amount really um you certainly can't sell them uh so having software that, that we can sell and that musicians are are using and in increasing numbers and you know really uh, enjoying what dorico can do that's you know that's really what we love to see and you know we're fortunate to have well i say we're fortunate to have um you know, many thousands of, of very happy customers. Uh, we are fortunate to have that. We don't take them for granted. But the reason we have happy customers is because we sweat the details and we work extremely hard uh, to to really try to make the software as as rich and as and as good as as our imaginations and our abilities will allow us. Um, and you know, yeah, we're very we're very proud of Dorico. Uh, we're very very uh, grateful to everybody who, especially the early adopters who've been using it now for for you know for years, even before it had all of these. As you say, robust and sophisticated features that it has today. You know, it, it, when it first came out, obviously it had a really smashing engraving engine, great note spacing. But you know, as we all know, famously, because you broke the story and then broke us, no chord symbols in version 1.0. You know, all these things. But now they're all there, and they're all as good as they, you know, as good as they as they can be. Of course, chord symbols. Are worth saying just very quickly that one of the, you know, there's more features for chord symbols in this version in 3.1. The ability to have chord symbols for individual players. Chord diagrams have been have been um, improved. We have finally done some work on Music XML export in this version, so now have the the beginnings of a truly useful Music XML export, which does include chord symbols, rehearsal marks, bar numbers, tonality systems, accidentals, articulations, bar line types. You know, so all of these things, and it was already doing things like notes and lyrics and repeat endings and so on. So. You know, in every area, we we continue to you know spread ourselves very thin for sure, but to really try to to continue to enrich and, and round out Dorico's capabilities and make sure that it it is you know developing into the tool we want it to be, which is you know whether you are a student trying it for the first time with Dorico SE or a pro like you doing you know doing high end work for for a variety of clients or you're a composer working in in movie music, whatever it is, whatever it is. We want Dorico to be to be your go-to tool, and um, you know we won't stop until we've until we got there. Well, I think what you described uh, just in that last sentence that you said, and also, um, you know, uh, loving what you do and uh, really taking the utmost care um, to make it as good as it possibly can, and working and working and working at it, uh, it can be it can describe what you're doing, which is something that all of us in the field appreciate, which is creating the tools with which we uh, create 
the product that ultimately will be in front of musicians and those of us that are either engravers or copyists or comp obviously composers, arrangers, uh, students, and so on. We spend so much time with this software, with your software, other software, uh, that we tend to know it uh, as well as any of our best friends or our loved ones. And that's often why, you know, these discussions sometimes get passionate and they get heated. And uh, it's not because, uh, you know, we're trying to do anything other than improve, improve, improve and iterate and, uh, and advance and innovate. And uh, that can be said both in terms of the software and the tool side and also the music itself, obviously. Absolutely. And uh, that's why I think, you know, at least we'll have a couple of views on this video that is approaching two hours uh, now. <laughs> Set me going and I never shut up. That's the problem. Hey, you know, well, it, like it, the same thing we said here, but it's, it's great fun. And, uh, you know, to recapitulate here um, in the, uh, the final uh, uh, movement of uh, our fi final flow of, of this video, so to speak, <laughs> uh, we'll just say that uh, Dorco 3.1 is out now. Uh, that's a free update for any uh, registered uh, uh, license holder of Dorico 3. Uh, Dorico SE is also out. That's a brand new product. That is something that is uh, uh, anyone can download and it's available now as well. Um, that is not time limited. You can use it for as long as you like and you can even open um, pro or elements projects uh, in it and view them and play them back and print them. Uh, so that's out. Uh, go to Steinberg's site, Dorico, uh, Dorico sites, Dorico, just Dorico.com. Is that right? You can get to it from Dorico.com. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and actually just one more thing, Philip, also um, check out the Dorico YouTube channel because Anthony has done another series of videos that explain in more depth the four main features we've talked about, plus um, a whiz through loads of other little features. And of course, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, there's also a brand new tutorial series to help people getting started with Dorico. It's targeted at Dorico SE, but actually, <clears throat> excuse me, even if you're thinking about trying Dorico Pro or Dorico Elements, working through those videos uh, with Anthony, who shows you how to start a new project, find your way around the software, do some note input. Um, they're, they're actually a really nice little introduction to, to the main concepts behind Dorico and how to find your way around, whether it's SE, Elements, or Pro. So um, if, uh, if people want to check those out as well, they can be found at youtube.com slash Dorico. Great. Thank you. And uh, the final note, of course, since this is being released uh, in conjunction with the NAM show, 2020 NAM show, uh, do go and check out, if, if you're out in Anaheim and you're visiting the show, uh, do, go and check out uh, the Steinberg uh, area, the Yamaha, and specifically the Dorico section, the Elite 2 Ballroom at the Marriott Hotel, uh, which is adjacent to the uh, main um, Anaheim Convention Center out there, uh, January 16th through 19th, 2020. So, uh, with that, uh, Daniel, uh, thank you so much for taking the time to expound on all things Dorico, uh, past, present, and future. It's always great to chat with you. And uh, until next time, looking forward to the next one. Thanks for having me, Philip. Cheers. Bye-bye.